I would contend if you want to build anything in this world, you have to have the right materials. I'm not much of a builder, but I've watched things being built. In fact, some of you, if you were here a few years ago, you might remember this picture. Anybody remember that? This was a couple years ago in our great hall. And if you're newer to ABC, you might not remember this, but we actually built a house in this church. It was kind of a wild time. This was during the COVID season, and we partnered with a missions organization called Buckner Missions. And we actually built a house for a family of 12 in South Texas, but the way we did that was we built that house in this house, and we were there in the great hall, and we started to construct the framing of this home, took over for a whole month, and we disassembled that framing, and we actually shipped it to South Texas with a team who then put it back together on site. But as we were building this home in the great hall, I remember looking at our church, and you might remember those days, I was thinking our church is starting to look like Home Depot. It's pretty wild, because there was wood everywhere, lumber, stacks of it. There were nails, there were power tools, there were hammers. I mean, it was all over the place. It was crazy. But why did it look like the Home Depot? It's because if you're going to build anything, you have to have the right materials. And today in Exodus chapter 35, Moses is going to be called to build something. And he's actually also called to build a house. But he's got a lot of pressure because he's called to build God's house, the first tabernacle there in the Old Testament. And likewise, what you're going to see is Moses is going to require the right materials, and he's going to require the right workers. And during this season, he's commissioned with this task to create this place where God's presence would dwell. Because up to this point, Moses has led Israel out through the Exodus. He's taken them from bondage in Egypt across the Red Sea. And God has led them by cloud and by fire. And then God created a covenant with them and then actually even renewed that covenant after they fell. And then God told Moses, it's time for you to build a house for me to dwell in. And he gets to work, and you're going to see he's going to call in the right materials. And likewise, I want you to know that our God is still building today, and he actually calls us to be a part of that work. Now, I want to clarify a few points. We're not called to actually build a tabernacle in this place. Why? It's because we are the tabernacle. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, if you place your faith in Jesus Christ as your risen Lord and Savior, the Spirit of God, remember the Helper, he dwells in us and he begins to tabernacle with us. He lives in us and walks with us wherever we go. But while we are the tabernacle, 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15, Paul calls the church the household of God. That God dwells here with us as we gather together because we're two or one or gathered, God is with us as well. And where the church itself is called God's house, God's household. And in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus promised he would build that house. He promised that he would continue to build his church. So the question then is, how does Jesus build his church? Can I tell you the answer? It's through you and it's through me. That he actually builds his kingdom and he builds his local body, Austin Baptist Church, through us. Peter echoes these sentiments. I want to give you these verses because it will lay a foundation before we get into Exodus. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, this is what Peter says. He says, as you come to him, as you come to Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, he says, you yourselves are living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Peter says that every born-again believer is a living stone built on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. And God builds his church through these stones. Born-again believers coming together, he builds something beautiful for the world to see. What that means is the stone we see in this building, which by the way is beautiful stone and I'm thankful for it, but we must not forget that this stonework, these stones are not the church. The church is not a building. The church is not stone. The church is living stones. We are the stones that God brings together to build something beautiful. You see, the material God is looking for to build his kingdom is you and it's me. And what I think God wants to do right now through Austin Baptist Church is build something incredible. How could you not believe that after looking at a result like last weekend? 
where you see God is at work and he's provided immeasurably more than we could ask, think, or imagine. And it's clear as day that God is at work in this local faith family. And I believe God wants to continue to build his kingdom right here through the local expression of Austin Baptist Church. But that good work will require some materials. And the materials are you and me. So then what does that look like? That means we all need to be a part of this good work. And today we're going to look at Moses as he builds up the tabernacle. We're going to see some commonalities of what it takes to build God's house. And my hope and prayer is that we might answer that call in these coming days and years. Because if we all come to the Lord ready and willing, I believe we'll look back years from now astounded by what God built here on this hill. So if you have your Bible, join me right there in Exodus chapter 35. And we're going to look at this topic of how do you build God's house. And we're going to begin in verse 4 this morning. We're told Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of generous heart, let him bring the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins and goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lights, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and stones for setting, for the ephod, And four, the breast piece. So Moses stands before the congregation, before Israel, and he begins to receive an offering. He commands the congregation to take a contribution to the Lord. And what is the contribution he asked for? It's a lot of expensive stuff. Did you see it? He asked for them to start opening up their own personal treasuries to bring gold and silver and bronze and purple and scarlet fabrics and oil and spices and incense and stones. And Moses commands for them to bring these things to help build this house, to help build that tabernacle. So the question then might be if you're reading that, who just has that kind of stuff laying around? How can somebody just give up all that gold and all that stone? I will tell you, who just has that kind of stuff laying around is Israel in that moment. Israel had a lot of that stuff. And why did they have a lot of that stuff? It's because God gave them that stuff when they came out from Egypt. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 36, as they're about to make their way out from 400 years of bondage, this is what the Lord told Israel. He said, it says, the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have whatever they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. What you see happen is something pretty astounding. God takes these slaves out of bondage, and after the ten plagues, they can tell that the Lord is with Israel. And God gives them so much favor that they can go up to Egyptians and say, hey, can I have that? And they say, yeah, have whatever you want. Get out of here, please. Take it all. But what happened in that moment is something unprecedented. God took a bunch of slaves and he made them rich. He made them rich. And he gave them all of these precious jewels, all of these precious things. And why? God blessed them to actually ultimately be a blessing. And God gave them those resources to steward to help build up his house. And what I want us to see today is this first point that we learn there in Exodus, and it applies in the New Covenant as well. God builds his house through generous givers. This is what you see. Because the time has come for them now to build God's house, and lo and behold, they have everything that they need. And they have it because God blessed them to be a blessing, and he gave them these things to steward them, to then use them to build up his house, to build the kingdom. And the question then is, why were they so generous? Because if you don't know how the story goes, they do come and they start giving all these things. In fact, they give so much that they already have finished the building, they don't need anything else for the provisions, and Moses even tells them to stop. So then why on earth were they so generous? I think it's for a couple reasons. Number one, it's because they knew that they were just a bunch of slaves without God. They knew that they were just a bunch of slaves without God. 
It was hard for them to hold on to things close-handedly after they watched God do miraculous things that they couldn't do for themselves. And when God had rescued them from bondage, that changed their heart. They said, you know what? He's our master. He's the one in charge. It's because they knew they were a bunch of slaves without God. But then secondly, they knew that all that they had actually came from him. They knew all their stuff was actually God's stuff. They knew they didn't earn those things. They knew that ultimately God was the one who gave them that grace. He provided everything good in their household. This caused them out of gratitude to then be generous with what they had, knowing that he was the one that gave it to them to begin with. And can I tell you, healthy churches have the same mindset. Healthy churches have generous givers. Why? It's because generous givers realize we're just a bunch of slaves without God. We're a bunch of slaves. The Bible says we were actually slaves to our sin, and Jesus set us free. Jesus set us free from the bondage of sin and death. And when we understand without Christ, we are just slaves to our sin, but he has given us freedom. That changes our hearts. It changes our perspective. But then likewise, healthy churches are full of people who truly understand everything that I have in my life, it's all his anyway. He's the one who gave it to me. We're told every good and perfect gift is from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no shadow or variation of change. Healthy churches have the same mindset that we're just stewards holding on to God's stuff, and it is our joy to use those things for God's purposes. Healthy churches are filled with healthy believers who take care of God's house. Unhealthy churches are full of people who don't do that. In fact, I will say unhealthy churches, and I've seen many of them, they have to create revenue streams outside of their people just to pay for God's stuff. They have to go outside because on the inside, people won't take care of God's house, so they create revenue streams. There's churches that will go to for, seek out grants, government help, subsidizing, all these things. And why? It's because they don't have generous givers that are building up God's house. And can I just say praise be to God that we have generous givers in this church. I'm humbled. I'm humbled to lead a church full of generous givers that are committed to building up God's house. And I want to thank you after last week. When you look at a number like that, to me it's not even about the number. It's about what the number represents. The number represents our church's desire to be open-handed with God. To say, Holy Spirit, it's all yours. You just tell me what to do. And it's our church saying together that, you know what, God, we want to be a part of this work. Because isn't it amazing? God could have just taken that money from the Egyptians and used it himself, but he let it pass through Israel. Why? It's so that they got to be a part of the blessing of God's work here on this earth. In the same way, God gives us these resources. Why? It's so we can be a part of the blessing of God's work right here on this earth. And praise be to God that our church is full of so many healthy givers who take care of God's house. And I want to thank you for that. Especially on a day like today, which I told you we are theming as First Fruits Sunday. What does that mean? We're asking the church to give a First Fruits offering towards their Light the Way commitment. Why is that? It's because ultimately we're seeking to have a set amount of money, to have these resources come in in the new year so that we can hit the ground running on expanding our mission, on extending the message, and on eliminating our debt. So praise be to God for those in this room who were able to make a first fruits offering today. Or if you were like me, I went online three days ago and I did it online and I offered my first fruits offering there. You can do so as well. But I encourage you this morning, be generous with the Lord. I thank you for your generosity, but I also implore you, may we continue to be a generous people. May we fulfill our commitments by God's grace. May we make the budget this year and even exceed it, because in that place of exceeding it, there's blessing to be a blessing to others. And praise be to God that he invites us to build up his kingdom, and God builds his house through generous givers. But what Moses teaches us is that God asks for more than just our wallets, Sometimes the wallet is the hardest thing to let go of, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's easy to cut a check. Honestly, for some people, the harder thing to let go of is your time, and it's your talent. It can be easy to let go of your treasure, and that's why God calls for all of it. He wants your time, your talent, and your treasure, 
That's why Moses says in verse 10, Let every skillful craftsman among you come and make all that the Lord has commanded. The tabernacle, its tent and its covering, its hooks and its frames, its bars, its pillars and its bases. The ark with its poles, the mercy seat and the veil of the screen, the table with its poles and all its utensils, and the bread of the presence. The lampstand also for the light with its utensils and its lamps, and the oil for the light, and the altar of incense with its poles, and the anointing oil with the fragrant incense, and the screen for the door at the door of the tabernacle. So what you see in verse 10 is Moses then commands them not only to bring their treasure, but he says, I need you to bring your time and your talent. He said, I need the congregation to do more than open up their wallets. I also need you to open up your schedule. I need you to open up your talents. I need you to come and give all that you not just have, but also all that you are to the work of the Lord. And what we see in this is the second point, that not only does God build his house through generous givers, but God also builds his house through committed servants. Through committed servants. That's why that first word Moses said was, come. He said, come. Because you can't commit to anything if you don't come. He said, I need you to show up. He invited others to show up and be a part of the building of God's house. Moses was a wise leader, and he was smart enough to realize that God's mission was too big for him alone. He understood it would require many, many more people who were willing to give their time and energy to help build up something beautiful together. And in the same way, it requires all of us to build a dynamic church In fact, it's interesting that this is what God has always intended. He said we are one body with many parts, is what Paul calls the church. And all these parts come together to do the work of the Lord. But it's impossible to build a great church just as it would have been impossible to build a great tabernacle if people don't show up. This is why the Bible actually says we need to make sure we show up that we are a part of a local church. In Hebrews chapter 10, this is what the Lord says. We're reminded to consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. We're told not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. He says, don't get in the habit of not going to church. That's what he said. Because can we just be honest? It's easy to get out of habit, isn't it? Going to church is a habit we actually have to build. There's these disciplines, is what they're called, that we have to build into our lives. And COVID got a lot of people out of the habit of going to church, and it was hard to get back into it. And it's easy to get distracted and to not come, but you have to come if you want to build a dynamic church. And I'm not legalistic. I know people miss weekends for different reasons. I miss weekends every now and then as I go spend time with family and travel and do things. But at the big picture, we need to commit to the church. We have to be committed to say, count me in. And why? It's because you can't build anything special if you don't show up. And I will tell you, you won't build incredible relationships. You won't build a support system. You won't build up your faith and your spiritual maturity. You won't build up the community that you're looking for if you won't give it time to actually be cultivated. This is why we have to consistently come. But Moses says not only to come, and then what else did he say? He said, come and make. He said, not only do I need you congregation to show up regularly, but he said, I need you to get to work. He said, I actually need you to start making some stuff. And he listed a whole lot of stuff. Did you catch it? It was all the holy things that go into the tabernacle, all these things you've studied over the course of the Old Testament. And he says, I need people to get to work. And Moses is imploring Israel to move from being spectators to being servants. That's what he's imploring them to do. Moses is saying, there's way too much work for me to do by myself. He says, I can't make all this stuff myself. I'll be here forever. He says, I need people who are committed, but I also need people who are servants. That not only will show up, but they will actually get involved in the work of the ministry. And this is God's design for the church. Did you know that? God's design for the church is not just for you to be a spectator. Right now you're spectating, and I get it. But he's actually invited you to come be a participant, to be a part of it, to actually jump into kingdom service. In 1 Peter chapter 4, 
where this is explained when Peter starts talking about the spiritual gifts that God has given us. In verse 10, we're told, as each has received a gift, use it for what? To serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. God wants us to steward our finances, but he also wants us to steward our spiritual gifts. He wants us to steward our time. He wants us to steward our calendar. And how are we supposed to steward these gifts of very grace? He says, use them to serve others, to serve the church. Not just to be served, but like Christ, to then serve others in his likeness. What does that mean? It means every single person in the church has an opportunity to jump in. To jump in and serve. I believe every born-again believer, the Bible teaches, has at least one spiritual gift. And why was that spiritual gift given to you? It was to serve and build up the church. It's to serve one another. And can I tell you, the foundation of Austin Baptist Church was service. That was the foundation in 2007. When the church was founded, there was no pastor. There was no Moses figure in front of them. There was no one to tell them to go go do these things. There were no budgets, buildings, but there were a lot of committed servants that said, how can we help? What can we do? How can I use my time and my talent and, yes, my treasure to help build up the kingdom of God? And can I tell you, it is so important that we never lose that foundation here at ABC, that we must continue to be committed servants to show up and to be a part of what God's do, God is doing here. Like I will tell you, I'm so thankful that there are hundreds of volunteers right now, did you know, that make church happen every, every Sunday. Oftentimes in scripture, you only look to the Moseses and you never think about the hundreds of people that were serving around Moses all the time. Like there's a lot of nameless people that built that tabernacle that you see right there in that passage. And can I tell you, every church is full of many nameless people to a lot of the public that make things happen in a church. Like right now, there are people all over our church that are serving. And why? It's because they're committed servants. I'll brag on my wife. Some of you may not know this. My wife right now is serving. Some of you might wonder, man, does he have a wife? There's no one ever sitting by him up there up front. I do. And can I tell you, Bethany is a committed servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. She's a committed servant of the church. And you know why she's not here by me in this first hour? It's because she's taking care of some of your babies right now. And she's doing that to serve you. She's not doing it begrudgingly. She's not doing it because I'm forcing her to. She's doing it because she wants to. Because she wants to build God's house. And she's been doing that, can I just tell you, long before I ever met her, she's been doing it since she was a teenager. And you know what I'm so proud to say now is now my wife has my daughter in that room teaching her to do the same. And now my 12-year-old daughter is taking care of babies with my wife, and my wife is training her to be a committed servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they go to Bible study, and then they go to church in the third service. And can I just tell you, my wife's not the only committed servant around here. There are a lot of you I could start shouting out names. There are people every weekend that take care of our kids, that teach them God's word. There are people that will serve in the youth ministry in this upcoming hour. There are people right now serving in the media that no one even knows that's a part of this that's making church happen. There are people that will teach your Bible fellowship groups, that will be exercising hospitality. There will be people that will make phone calls this week to the homebound and to the sick. There will be people that will call the visitors. There will be people that will organize mission trips. There will be people that will usher and greet at the doors. There will be people that are going to bring out the coffee and all these things. And can I tell you, how does that happen? It happens because there's committed servants that want to build up God's house. And can I just encourage you in this room, if you haven't found a way to jump into service, it's not too late. Because God has invited us to get in the game. So many people treat church like they treat a football game. Because when you go to football, you know what you do? You sit in the bleachers. You sit in the bleachers, and you know what also you do, to be honest? You start criticizing. That's what you do. If you're like me, you start armchair quarterbacking. Oh, they need to do this. I can't believe they're doing that. Oh, that was a lousy play. They should have called something else. And we criticize from far away. But the truth is we also never get in the game and do anything. But here's the difference in the church. In the church, 
you have an invitation to get out of the bleachers and in the game. You actually can get on the field and you can make a difference. Did you know that? Believe it or not, you can make a difference in this church. And for Austin Baptist Church to grow and to reach thousands of people in Austin and beyond, it will require all of us to give generously, but also to commit to service. God has invited you, just as he's invited me, to get out of the bleachers and into the game. And when you get into the game, you start to experience God in a different way. Because your faith starts to grow as you watch God use you in ways that you didn't think he could. I remember when I was in college at at age 20, someone encouraged me to start teaching Awanas as a 20-year-old college male. This was the worst idea ever in my church, but I did it. And you know what happened? My faith grew as a result. I remember I worked at a camp when I was 22 years old, never preached a message, was terrified of doing it, never thought about it. Assistant director at the camp encouraged me to preach one evening, one message. I sweated all week. It was difficult. I was scared, and people got saved afterwards. And what happened was I grew in my faith because I stepped into the game, and I realized God can do more through me than I thought. And the same way, if you want your faith to grow, it will not grow until you take a step of faith out from the bleachers and onto the field. God builds his church through generous givers. He builds his church through committed servants. But then lastly, we're going to see this. God also builds his house through spirit-filled leaders. Through spirit-filled leaders. Go to verse 30 of our text. Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill and intelligence, with knowledge and with all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood, for work in every skilled craft. And he has inspired him to teach, both him and Aholiab, the son of Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to do every sort of work done by the engraver or by a designer or by an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen or by a weaver by any sort of workman or skilled designer. So what on earth is happening here in the passage? Moses is given this vision. He said, bring your treasure. Then he said, bring your time and your talent. I need servants. But then also Moses began to commission leaders. Did you catch that? There were two by name that he put in charge, Bezalel and Aholiab. And these were two people that he said, I need you to actually start leading some of these people. Because Moses was wise enough to realize that he couldn't do it all himself. He actually learned this lesson earlier in the study in Exodus chapter 18. His father-in-law Jethro taught him this message. He said, you can't judge everybody, do everything. He said, it's impossible. He said, you have to learn how to empower leaders and then multiply your impact through them. So Moses started to lead that way in Israel. And what you see here in the 35th chapter is another chapter of that story. He says, I can't build this by myself. Instead, I need people who are spirit-filled, able to teach, able to lead others, to step into leadership and to lead these servants. And you see enter the picture these two names that oftentimes get forgotten in Scripture. But you have Bezalel and Aholiab. And what are they doing? They're stepping into spiritual leadership. That's what they're doing. They start leading God's people. That they were already servants, I imagine. But in that moment, the Spirit filled them and led them to begin leading others. And by them leading others, Moses' impact was actually multiplied and the work progressed. And this is a picture of what God wants to do. Can I tell you, good churches, healthy churches, the mission is way too big for just their pastor. It's too big. Like if I cast a small enough vision that I can do it myself, then you should probably find another church. Bad vision is small enough that one leader can do it. Good vision is so big that it requires other leaders to jump in. It requires other people to step up. 
because ultimately one person cannot do it all alone. I will add to that, our staff cannot do it all alone. And the way churches are designed to work is that we actually are all called to do what? Go and make disciples. God wants all of us to step into spiritual leadership, to mature and grow in that way to where we become leaders of other leaders, where we are discipled and then we disciple others. And for our church, once again, to continue to grow and reach our city, it means more leaders have to rise up. But can I tell you this? Many people will not step into leadership of the church. And it's always just completely boggled my mind. Because churches, even ours, can be filled with amazing leaders in the workforce, in the community, in their professional careers. But when it comes to church, many of those dynamic leaders take a back seat and don't get involved in things. This happens in churches all across America. Why is that? I believe there's a spiritual issue that's underneath all of that. And it's actually spoken to in Scripture. In Hebrews chapter 5, this is what we're told. We're told in verse 11... The author of Hebrews says, about this, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. He says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again. The basic principles of the oracles of God, he said, you need milk and not solid food. What we're told even going into the first century church is sometimes leaders refuse to step up. And they're getting admonished in that passage. They're being told, Get off milk and move on to solid food. That you should be the one teaching other people by this point. But why does this happen? It boggles my mind once again, because when you think about maturity in the physical realm, we always want to mature. I have children, they always want to get older than they actually are. And I bet you understand that. That this goes not only on in childhood, but it goes on. When you're a kid, you want to stay up later. You want to get to that next notch. When you're in elementary, you want to be in middle school. You're in middle school, you want to be in high school. Then when you're in high school, you want to have a car. Then when you have a car, you want to go to college. And then when you go to college, you want to make money. And then when you make money, you want to make more money. And then when you make more money, you want to have a higher title. Then you want to have retirement. We always want to advance and mature in every way except spiritually. Spiritually, some people are okay with staying babies. And they just don't want to grow up. Just want to keep doing the same old things, spectating, watching from afar, never going all in, never challenging themselves to lead out in a way that actually would require God in their life. And consequently, many people stay on milk that should be on solid food. And for our church to continue to grow and expand its impact, we need people to move from milk to solid food. We need people to grow up in Jesus Christ and to step forward into spiritual leaderships in their homes, but also in this house as well. I remember my wife at our former church when we served somewhere else, she was once again serving in the nursery over there too. But I remember as she was serving in the nursery, I was blown away by this one lady who came up to her one time. And I heard this story. But this young mom had identified a deficiency that was in the nursery ministry. It was a small little niche, an area in there that that truly was not the best it could be. It was an area Bethany already knew was not the best it could be, but she lacked the resources, the people, the leaders to address it. Well, this parent addressed it, and then she came to Bethany and said, hey, I've seen this problem. This is here in Bethany, I'm sure. She didn't tell me this, but I'm sure she's thinking, okay, here we go, because I know how that goes too. Once again, it's easy to identify problems. And she starts identifying this problem, but you know what she said after that? She said, and I believe I know how to fix it, and I'd love to do it if you would let me. She said, I'd love to lead and help address this issue. And you know what happened? She did it. And then this lady started leading another group of ladies, and they started taking care of that need right there in the church. And how does that happen? It happens because spirit-filled leaders stepped up. And the same way in our church, for us to become all that God has called us to be, it will require spirit-filled leaders to step up. Last week, I was in that starting point class. We had a couple people come to know Christ, like Matt said, but I remember I spoke to one person in that class, and they came and visited our church, and I was so happy about this. He said they'd been visiting the church because they saw our youth pastor, Corbin Smith, at a lot of the area football games and athletic events, which was very encouraging. He said, I saw your youth staff is going to games and participating in the community, and I thought if they care, we want to come see what's going on over here. And praise be to God, and it's a credit to Corbin and and Katie and our youth staff. 
But you know what I said to him? Because he started asking about youth ministry and what do we need to do and how could this continue to grow in impact. I told him the way a youth ministry or a church grows in impact is when 50 families start becoming Corbin out there at the same places. When they actually go start leading at the football games. They go out there and talk about our church. They go out there and invite others to church. They go out there and share the gospel. And the church will explode in growth when more people step into leadership with the gospel of Jesus Christ, when they step into leadership and ownership in the church to advance the mission and to reach our community. Because I, can I tell you the secret sauce of impactful churches? Impactful churches are filled with impactful people. That's how it works. Impactful churches are filled with impactful people that want to see God light up their life, but also their home, their neighborhood, and the world. And we're all invited to be those kind of people. And I encourage you to take your next step today. Maybe it is to give for the first time. Maybe it is to serve for the first time. Or maybe it's to move from servant to leader. But if you do, I want to encourage you with what the results could be. And we'll close right here in chapter 40, verse 34. After all the works completed, this was the end result. We're told, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting... And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. People gave generously. They committed and served. And then they led and stepped into spiritual leadership. And what was the result? The result was the glory of God was seen in that place by all who walked around it. And can I tell you, the same thing can happen in our church spiritually. That as our church continues to cultivate spiritual leaders, as we step into kingdom service, I believe Austin, Texas can drive by this church and see the work of this church, and they'll see the glory of God being displayed through ABC. How does that happen? Jesus says, he says, let your light shine before others so that... They'll see your good works and give glory to our Father who's in heaven. And when we start to serve and we move from spectator to servant, when we start to give and then when we start to lead, people see us shine differently than other churches. And I believe light the way is not the end. It's the beginning is what it is. It's the beginning. And it is the beginning If we step into service saying, God, what do you want to do? And how can you use me to help build your house?